Why am I driving to my mother's house at 11 o'clock at night in the pouring rain? Why are my husband and children safe and dry at home, probably already asleep in their beds? Why did Bradley threaten to divorce me? I haven't even done anything. What the heck is going on? Why won't anybody talk to me? My name is Emma Smith. Except professionally, I go by my maiden name, Johnson. My husband Bradley never had a problem with that. He understood how important it was to me that I earned my degrees and certifications in clinical psychology under my own name before we got married. He was always supportive. And that's why we didn't have the ceremony until I was 26. That day, just over nine years ago, was probably the happiest day of my life. We had the perfect wedding, not too big, not too small, and all of our families were there. My father, Jim, is an amazing dancer. He'd been taking lessons for something like 15 years. That's how he met his wife, Grace. Technically, she's my stepmom, but I was already 17 when they first met, so she didn't have a hand in raising me. My mother, Linda, was also there with her fourth husband, Glenn. Having them all together at the wedding was a major feat of diplomacy, but it went smoothly. I even saw Mom sitting at a table with Dad and Grace while I was dancing with Bradley. After the father-daughter dance, we wanted to start our family right away since we'd waited to get married. Braylon is eight and Caden is six, a girl and a boy, two years apart. Just like me and my younger brother Tommy, I know it's silly, but it makes me feel like I accomplished everything correctly. They're at home now, and I'm not. I should go back. I don't know why I should have to do this. I belong in my house with my family, and Bradley needs to just get over his hurt feelings and accept what's going to happen. I need to go back home. I need to make things right with him. But I can't. I'm not welcome. I should explain. I arrived home early, as I'd planned. I had the groceries I needed for Bradley's favorite dinner, my mom's meatloaf recipe, believe it or not, and a nice bottle of red wine, Idaho potatoes, sour cream, chives, Wisconsin cheddar cheese, and Brussels sprouts. I know lots of people don't like them, but I roast them with olive oil and a little salt and pepper, and they're just perfect. Key lime pie for dessert. Oh, and a few delicate little things I'd picked up at Victoria's Secret that Tuesday. So we'd spend the weekend making things special before I left for my conference. The one he didn't know about yet. The one I was planning on telling him about after dinner. It took me almost an hour to get everything ready. While the meatloaf was in the oven, I cleaned off the table and vacuumed the dining room, put out the good place settings, and had time to shower, do my hair and makeup, and slip into my new blue dress. The color really brings out my eyes. I dressed it up with a necklace Bradley had given me for our fifth anniversary. The kids liked my meatloaf okay, but I had to make mac and cheese for them since they wouldn't eat the potatoes or the sprouts. The instant he got home, after picking up the kids, the show began. Braylon and Caden tore around like the whirlwinds they are, and we barely managed to change their shoes and put away their things before dinner. I served their food, got them seated, and was pouring the wine when Bradley joined us, his eyebrow raised in question. I just smiled, beaming the most loving, adoring smile I could muster. It only seemed to make him more concerned. Everyone was happy and pleased. They all praised my cooking. The kids devoured their meal and even had a small slice of key lime pie each. Caden didn't like his, saying it tasted sour. Braylon finished it for him after we settled them in front of their favorite movie, one they'd seen countless times. Bradley nudged me back into the dining room, where he had already tidied up and loaded the dishwasher. He poured the last of the red wine for me, and a finger of Glen Morangi for himself, neat, before taking his seat. He inquired if I would disclose the reason behind the evening's special arrangements, questioning if I couldn't surprise him without a particular occasion. I expressed my enjoyment of the evening and acknowledged the effort put into the dinner, but highlighted that it wasn't a birthday, anniversary, or any special day. It was simply a Friday night, prompting him to inquire further. I admitted to playfully deceiving him, hinting that I might need his help next week. He asked about the nature of the favor, and I explained that I would be attending a conference in Chicago for four days, from Tuesday to Friday, requiring him to take on the role of a single dad temporarily. His demeanor shifted slightly as he acknowledged the responsibility he would have to shoulder in my absence. Anticipating our time apart, I teased him with promises of a passionate weekend together before my departure. I leaned forward, adding a suggestive glance to my words, hinting at the excitement to come upon my return. 
He nodded skeptically, questioning why he was just hearing about the conference at that moment. I explained that the invitation had recently come up, highlighting that I had only been invited and hadn't discussed it earlier. Despite my attempts to reassure him, he expressed his disappointment at being informed late and his concern about the situation. My attempts to calm him down seemed to have the opposite effect. He suddenly stood up, gesturing for me to remain seated, and muttered his frustration, clearly upset. He tried to control his emotions, acknowledging his desire to avoid arguing in front of the children. He instructed me to put the kids to bed and indicated that he needed time to gather his thoughts before continuing the discussion. With a tense grip on the chair, he shook his head and went upstairs, leaving me to reflect on how the conversation had not gone as planned. He spent the next twenty minutes pacing around the house like an agitated tiger. Glancing at his phone, he'd angrily read something, mutter curses under his breath, and resume pacing. At one point, he made a call and left a voicemail, saying, It's Bradley. She's acting like Linda right now. It's happening now. Please call me the instant you get this. What on earth did acting like Linda mean? What did my mom have to do with this? Not long after, his phone rang, and he stepped outside to take the call, shooting me a glare. Clearly, he didn't want me or the kids to overhear. He returned inside, but was called out again after a brief moment. The kids seemed puzzled, but unfazed by his behavior. As the movie neared its end, he disappeared into the kitchen, where I heard his coffee grinder buzzing. Surprisingly, Braylon and Caden didn't resist their bedtime routine much, brushing their teeth and getting into pajamas without fuss. Somehow, they sensed that something was amiss. I too felt jittery throughout. What was troubling him? What did he know? Who was he talking to? And why bring up mom? With the kids tucked in, I descended to find Bradley back at the table with a full pot of coffee, two mugs, and a large Yeti cup. He instructed me to sit, and I obeyed. He poured the coffee, but I declined, mentioning that it would keep me awake. He insisted, saying I would need it. I pressed him to tell me what was bothering him, and he responded by saying he would if I would, assuring me that nothing was wrong. He explained that I was worrying unnecessarily, emphasizing that it was just a conference, a one-time event that I needed to do for myself. I questioned his motives, and he reaffirmed his stance, saying it was exactly as he had stated. He expressed dissatisfaction with the taste of the coffee, prompting me to question what was wrong. Despite my reassurance that the coffee was fine, he began a conversation by asking if I considered him stupid. After affirming that I didn't, he questioned whether I believed myself to be smarter due to my graduate degree in psychology. I denied this and affirmed my respect for him as my husband, partner, and human being. He emphasized the importance of honesty in our conversation and warned against half-truths or sugarcoating. He insisted that he knew more about the situation than I thought and cautioned against lying or manipulation, emphasizing that it wouldn't end well if I attempted to deceive him. I assured him that I would never deceive him, but suggested that he might be deceiving himself. He questioned when I was invited to the conference and how long I had known about it. I explained that I had only mentioned it that evening, claiming it had just happened. He pressed further, asking if I had known before Tuesday and implying that I had planned the evening to soften him up for the news. I defended myself, insisting it wasn't like that, but his silence spoke volumes. I suggested that we go through the questions again. He asked who had invited me to the conference, to which I replied it was a colleague. He continued to inquire about who was covering the expenses for my attendance, pressing for a direct answer. I mentioned that I would reimburse them, but he insisted on a clearer response regarding who had arranged the fees, airfare, and accommodation. He expressed concern over our account statements for the past three months, suggesting that either I had planned this earlier or had undisclosed accounts. Despite his evident upset, I reassured him that he had nothing to worry about. He asked if Richard Taylor was attending the conference. I started feeling a surge of dread. A voice in my head mocked me for being foolish, but I pushed back, telling it to shut up and insisting that Bradley didn't know anything for certain. I admitted that Richard might be there, as he was presenting on Wednesday. Bradley showed me the conference agenda on his phone, expressing surprise that I didn't know about it, given my close friendship and professional relationship with Richard. I confessed that I did know, but had forgotten. Bradley urged me to stop making up stories and reminded me that he wasn't foolish, 
leaving me with nothing more to say. Bradley suggested recapping the situation. He asserted that weeks or months ago, my older colleague, who he implied had romantic intentions toward me, invited me on a fully funded romantic trip to the city, which I accepted. He accused me of springing this news on him last minute, distracting him with closeness, food, and romance, and leaving him with the responsibility of the kids to prevent his interference. I protested, denying his accusations. He reminded me of his earlier request not to lie to him or to myself, to which I insisted that I wasn't lying. Bradley interrogated me about the duration of my involvement with Richard. I denied any involvement, but he pressed further, asking about Richard's involvement with me and whether I had been involved with anyone else. He threw in a random question about the capital of California to check my presence of mind. My thoughts raced as I reassured myself that Richard couldn't possibly know anything, as we hadn't been due lovemaking. I believed Bradley had to trust me, being my husband. Bradley persisted, accusing me of being clouded by an affair fog and observing my guilty expression. I denied having an affair, but he suggested that perhaps I wasn't involved with Richard yet, noticing my expression change. I explained that Richard had invited me to the conference six weeks prior and assured Bradley that we would have separate accommodations and that I would reimburse Richard for expenses. I emphasized the conference's significance for my career and pleaded with Bradley to trust me, reaffirming my love and loyalty to him. Bradley took a slow sip of his black coffee, emphasizing his preference for unadulterated quality. He accused me of diluting that quality by planning everything behind his back, betraying him with secrets, lies, and deception. He asserted that my actions constituted betrayal, though the extent of it remained uncertain. I took a deep breath, trying to reassure myself that I hadn't done anything wrong yet. Bradley accused me of leaving myself vulnerable and setting myself up for closeness with Richard Taylor, suggesting that my actions indicated anticipation rather than explicit planning. I acknowledged that he wasn't entirely wrong in his assessment. My guilt resurfaced, leaving me speechless. Bradley questioned the purpose of the lingerie I had purchased, pointing out that he had seen the charges on the account. I explained that it was intended for him, for our weekend together, and for when I returned from the trip, though there wasn't much packed for the trip itself. He questioned whether any of the items were specifically for Richard, to which I hesitated before admitting that some might have been. Despite my assurances, Bradley expressed his lack of trust in me and his concerns about the situation. He asserted that my actions gave him plenty of reasons to worry, and he set down his mug, signaling the seriousness of the conversation. He laid out the terms, instructing me to leave the house immediately and go to my mother's place. He emphasized that I was not welcome and needed to have a serious conversation about married women's conduct. I was to stay overnight with Tom and Bernice, as he had already informed them, and they were expecting me. I protested, calling it absurd and claiming he couldn't do that. He countered by stating that what was truly absurd was going on a honeymoon with someone else and expecting him to accept it. He reminded me that we had dealt with similar situations before and warned me that if I didn't learn from this, the marriage would be over. He expressed his seriousness, stating that he was dead serious about his decision. I argued that he couldn't force me as he was my husband, not my boss. He acknowledged that he couldn't control me, but emphasized that if he didn't approve of my actions, he could file for divorce, asserting that it was a matter of partnership within the marriage. Despite my disbelief and protestations, he insisted on ending the marriage, stating that we would sort out the details later and that he would hire a lawyer the next day to serve me with divorce papers. In an attempt to prevent further action, he instructed me to visit my mother and suggested that if I wanted him to refrain from taking legal action, I should comply with his instructions. He reassured me that my mother was expecting me and had been informed about the situation. My phone rang and he urged me to answer. It was my mom who warned me about the seriousness of the situation and advised me to comply with Bradley's instructions to avoid regret. She mentioned bacon cookies and hung up, leaving me in shock. My phone buzzed again, and it was my brother, Tommy, who must have sent another message. He expressed concern about my situation, offering the spare room set up as a nursery for me and assuring me that I could stay as long as needed. Tommy emphasized that I should call when on my way, even if it meant waking them up during feedings. I declined Tommy's offer, 
but he insisted I come over by the next morning, threatening to sever our relationship if I didn't comply. He made it clear that taking sides against Bradley wasn't an option, asserting Bradley's correctness about the family curse. Tommy concluded the conversation by announcing plans to take everyone to IHOP the next day. Left alone, I questioned Bradley about what he had told Tommy and our family. Bradley stood up and explained that he had shared the truth with them, finding their insights helpful. He encouraged me to finish my coffee, pack a bag, and mentioned making a caramel latte for the road. Bradley assured me he would handle the kids, update his family, and postpone informing Chuck and Bethany to avoid an immediate revelation to my father, who would be devastated. Confused and alarmed, I pressed Bradley for details, particularly about Tommy's mention of a family curse. Bradley redirected me to discuss it with Linda, my soon-to-be ex-wife, leaving me puzzled about the unfolding situation. After downing the coffee with extra skim milk and two Splendas on my way out, a 16-ounce Yeti cup of double-shot non-fat caramel latte, a stop for gas, and two more for bathroom breaks, I pulled into Mom's driveway at ten minutes past midnight. The garage door opened and I parked in the empty bay. Huh. Where was Doug's car? Mom greeted me and expressed happiness at my arrival. She mentioned the importance of me coming and shook her head suggesting it wouldn't have been good otherwise. Inviting me inside, she informed me about cookies in the kitchen and offered tea. At 60, Mom still looked elegant. She maintained her figure gracefully, though it was showing its age. Her posture was impeccable. Despite having two children, she seemed untouched by osteoporosis. Her dark hair was streaked with gray but still lustrous and stylishly arranged, and her eyes were as blue as ever. Like mine. I hope to look half as good at her age. She began pouring tea without any request from me. I mentioned my preference for no caffeine, explaining that Bradley had made me drink both coffee and a double shot, leaving me jittery. She assured me that the tea she was serving was chamomile and reassured me that I would be fine, giving me a once-over. She mentioned that I had worn the same dress when talking to Bradley earlier that night. I explained that Bradley didn't allow me to change before kicking me out, I had to grab some stuff and leave. Tommy seemed distressed, repeating, Oh my! And when I questioned what was wrong with the dress, they mentioned its significance and Tommy's reference to a curse. Confused and desperate for information, I asked about Tommy's comment and the ongoing situation. In response, she handed me homemade ginger snaps and suggested we move to the sitting room for an explanation. There, I noticed the TV showing a paused football game surprising me because my mom typically avoided football. I inquired about Doug's whereabouts, and she revealed that Doug usually stayed with his friend Brian, with whom he had been in a relationship for almost 20 years. The revelation about Doug's handsomeness left me puzzled about why my mom was married to him. She detailed a complicated story about their marriage with Doug, emphasizing the societal pressures that led them to be married. They acknowledged the acceptance of gay couples marrying nowadays, but explained that, at their age, there were various complexities and layers to their situation. Doug, despite admitting he was gay, did not fully accept himself as such, and did not see himself living openly as a gay man. Instead, he considered his relationship with Brian unique. She clarified that Doug didn't feel shame about being gay, it just wasn't how he identified himself. They referred to their situation as being a beard, an old-fashioned term where gay men and lesbians would marry to meet societal expectations but maintain private lives outside the marriage. When asked about their own involvement, she denied being gay but admitted to being a terrible wife. They confessed to ruining their previous marriages due to various negative traits, especially hurting their father deeply. Tears welled up as they expressed their enduring love for their father and admitted noticing the love between me and Bradley urging me not to become like them. Overwhelmed with emotion, she broke down crying. In response to my confusion, they briefly rose from their seat, gesturing for me to stay put, mentioning they needed to fetch something to show me. While she was away, I heard her rummaging in one of the spare bedrooms. Glancing at the screen, I noticed it wasn't displaying the game, but was paused on two middle-aged male commentators. They might have been football players in their prime before age caught up with them. Mom returned with a blue dress in a clear plastic dry-cleaning cover. She noted that the dress they were showing me wasn't exactly the same as the one they wore. While the style differed, the skirt's length and color 
were nearly identical. They shared that they had worn this dress the night they ended their marriage to my father, almost thirty years ago. The reason for keeping the dress remained unclear to them, whether as a reminder of mistakes, a connection to their time with Jim, or because it made them feel beautiful. They recounted wearing the dress once more on their birthday that year, but it only made things worse. The incident happened in February, during a snowed-in period with little sunlight. They had bought the dress for Valentine's Day, but the plans were cancelled, and they ended up spending it with me and someone else. Jim never saw the dress, and to add to the unfortunate circumstances, it was a leap year, extending the duration of the dreaded month. At the time, I was part of a group of women and their husbands. I barely remember their names now. As couples, we were all pleasant, but when it was just us women, well, you wouldn't believe the scheming and gossip. We'd talk about what we'd do if the right man came along. One woman regularly cheated on her husband and boasted about it. Another was planning an affair with a co-worker, and we all supported her. Fortunately, her husband caught on before it went too far. I never engaged in any of that until one day I did. There was a local sports star who frequented bars and clubs, targeting married women and humiliating their husbands. He seemed to enjoy the power he had over them. He'd take these women to his hotel and give them an unforgettable experience, aiming to ruin them for other men. He was charming, wealthy, and famous, so he got away with it repeatedly. His activities were something of an open secret among women seeking excitement. I don't know how many marriages he destroyed, but it was more than a few. It was like a game to him. One of those venues was a dinner dance hall affiliated with the hotel. Our group of cheaters and aspirants decided to bring our husbands there on February 29th, leap night, to reconnect with each other and our spouses. You and Tommy were staying overnight with the porters, and we all had hotel rooms. What our husbands didn't realize was that attending with them was akin to buying raffle tickets. Mark Lavalier would select one fortunate lady for the evening, making her his chosen companion. That's why the night out excited us girls so much. My attention turned to the screen where Mark Lavalier, the commentator on the left, appeared. His name was displayed in a graphic beneath his chest, confirming his identity. As the revelation unfolded, it became apparent that Mark Lavalier was Mommy's awful boyfriend. The disclosure shattered my reality, leaving me feeling instantly dizzy and unwell. When questioned about it, I couldn't recall much. Only vague memories of staying with Nana and Grandpa while Dad was gone for a while when I was six years old. The details were hazy, but I vaguely remembered being upset during that time. My parents had tried to shield me from the situation, acknowledging that I might not recall any of it. During that period, Dad had disappeared for weeks, and counseling was sought as a way to address the issues in their marriage. Mom admitted to attempting to manipulate or control Dad, as he had accused her of doing. The counseling turned into a disaster, and Dad left for Atlanta in a fit of anger for ten days. Mom didn't know where he had gone until later, when he started taking temporary work assignments out of town. The mistreatment from Mom led to Dad's anger and departure from their marriage. Mom further revealed an incident with Mark approaching their table, taking her for a dance without permission. They danced for several songs, and Mark instructed Mom to slip out the back with him. When returning to the table for her purse, Mom faced Jim, who had witnessed the entire encounter. Jim covered for her, distracting Dad and allowing Mom to leave. This marked the end of her marriage to Dad. The separation and divorce took another year and a half, marking the real conclusion of Mom's marriage. Reflecting on that time, Mom expressed sorrow, acknowledging that the experience was beyond dreadful. However, she asserted that the worst part wasn't the separation itself, but rather the reasons behind it. Mom confessed that she would have sabotaged her marriage eventually, even if Mark, the scoundrel, hadn't chosen her that night. She highlighted her repeated destructive behavior with three different husbands, admitting her self-centered and entitled mindset, which she believed mirrored my current behavior. Mom emphasized that recognizing such behavior wasn't apparent at the time, and insisted that only a different perspective would reveal it. This conversation, she explained, was a kind of intervention, hoping that sharing her story would provide me with insight to change my ways before it's too late. She then shared her thoughts during her marriage with Jim, describing it as solid and deeply committed. 
Despite Jim being a wonderful and devoted husband, she succumbed to the temptation of a rare opportunity with Marc Lavalier, who promised to transform her into a glamorous, liberated goddess for a single night of enchanting closeness. After that night, Mom expected to return to her loving husband, believing that Jim's love would eventually overcome any initial hurt. She detailed waking up in her mother's recliner, having fainted due to the overwhelming situation. Mom handed me water and cookies, explaining that I had been unconscious for about 30 minutes. She suggested I wouldn't sleep given the circumstances and encouraged me to stay and continue the conversation. I expressed my intention to go to bed, but Mom doubted I would sleep given the resonance of her story with my thoughts. I reluctantly agreed that her story had indeed resonated with me. As I sat with the clear bag containing her blue dress next to me, Mom expressed concern about the possibility of me following in her footsteps. She questioned whether I was destined to ruin every marriage I entered, contemplating if I took my husband for granted while seeking solace in other men. Despite not having strayed yet, she acknowledged my intention to do so. She urged me to listen to my inner voice and expressed concern about the potential doom of my marriage if I continued down this path. When she inquired about my inner turmoil, she considered it a good sign that I was conflicted, but sighed in acknowledgement of the struggle. Mom acknowledged her own skill in silencing the voice of reason, admitting the difficulty of diagnosing and treating herself as a psychologist. She understood the rationalizations I had made, convincing myself that entertaining another man was acceptable, emphasizing the exhilaration and validation it provided. She cautioned against the dangerous thinking that Bradley's forgiveness would pardon or accommodate such transgressions, likening it to a medication that could lead to self-destruction. She highlighted the broader impact on Bradley, Braylon, Caden, Tommy, herself, and even my father, expressing deep concern about three generations of Johnson women following the same pattern of self-destruction. The thought of devastating my father by witnessing this cycle weighed heavily on her. As mom delved into family history, she clarified that Nana, being a reed, did not have any known instances of infidelity. However, she pointed to Gamma Carroll, who cheated on James, Jim's father, while he was sick and dying. Having a boyfriend named Ralph, Carroll eventually married him after James passed, but the marriage didn't last due to mutual unfaithfulness. Bob entered the picture later through a cancer family support group, and Jim initially distanced himself from his mother, holding her responsible for James's pass away. Mom explained that I might not have known this family history because I and Dad were already divorced when they started visiting Gamma Carol and Bob in Colorado. Dad forgave Carol eventually, bridging the divide between them, and he even became friends with Bob. Despite Bob not being at fault, Dad forgave his mother but struggled to forgive Mom. However, he eventually forgave her at my wedding after 20 years, even though she felt she didn't deserve it. She had been unrepentant, apologizing mainly for the cost it imposed on their relationship and attributing his hurt feelings to his fault. She admitted to being proud of the affair, emphasizing that her pride was the whole point. Mom expressed her fear of being single, noting that she had never experienced it and wouldn't know how to exist alone. Contrasting this with Dad, who had the wisdom to give himself time before getting seriously involved with someone else. She admitted her lack of understanding about his approach. She acknowledged giving Mark her number the first night they met, leading to subsequent calls and messages. Despite not planning it, she found herself caught up in another one of Mark's pickup spots, contributing to the cycle of relationships without sufficient self-reflection. Two weeks later, on St. Patrick's Day at an Irish pub, Mom recounted her shameful behavior when her marriage with Dad was hanging in the balance. She continued to see Mark quietly, even while attempting to patch things up with Dad. Mom thought her interactions with Mark had nothing to do with her relationship with Jim, believing that what he didn't know wouldn't hurt him. Reflecting on her actions, she considered herself stupid and foolish. In an attempt to deceive Dad, Mom pretended to break up with Mark by staging a phone call, playing the recording for Dad. However, Mark persisted until he was certain the divorce was finalized, then moved on to another conquest, a married woman named Maureen. By that time, Mom had already arranged to marry Jeff. Mom emphasized the need to grasp the entire narrative, as it wasn't solely about Dad and Mark, but extended further to her marriage with Jeff. 
Despite Jeff being a decent guy, Mom acknowledged he wasn't Jim. She married Jeff because he was available, and while she might have made it work with effort, she chose not to. Devoted to raising me and Tommy in the family home, Mom saw herself as only a part-time spouse. She had decided that if Jeff truly loved her, he would accept her choices, emphasizing that he had no other choice because he was a good guy. Mom believed that if he cared about being a good husband, he would comply with her decisions. For her, the external factors in her life weren't supposed to impact their relationship, and Jeff simply had to cope with it. Mom claimed it didn't imply she loved him any less, and wasn't truly depriving him of anything. She urged her mom to understand, and mentioned feeling dizzy and sick, but insisted she wasn't done. Following Jeff, mom entered a relationship with Danny, seeking a more open-ended dynamic since she knew she would spend time away from the marriage. Danny was open to having other partners, essentially cheating on mom, and she turned a blind eye to it, considering it her penance. Though she didn't precisely love him, mom married Danny, and their arrangement persisted for a while. As time passed, and her children grew older, mom felt neglected and intentionally sought attention elsewhere. She reasoned that if an open marriage was acceptable for Danny, then it should be acceptable for her. Feeling she wasn't impacting Danny, mom believed he would afford her the same leniency she had given him for the past six or seven years. However, she misjudged the situation. As the end approached, mom initiated things with Glenn. Mom insisted on sharing these details to make her daughter see the recurring pattern in her relationships. Describing Glenn as the best of her husband since dad, mom acknowledged that she took him for granted, assuming he would forgive her, regardless of her actions. The most significant argument occurred after Emma's wedding, where mom essentially ignored Glenn while focusing on reconciling with dad for closure. Jim had to point out that mom wasn't tending to her husband, treating Glenn with the same disregard she had shown to dad, Jeff, and Danny. Mom openly wept as she shared this part of her story. I could only gaze at my mother, absorbing the emotional weight of the revelation. My arms trembled as I urgently struggled my way to the bathroom, barely reaching the toilet before emptying my stomach into the bowl. My mom stood by me, holding my hair as I retched. She tried to console me, sharing her own mistakes, regrets, and misguided choices. In her words, she unfolded tales of broken marriages, selfish decisions, and a repeating pattern of seeking temporary solace outside the commitment she had made. She spoke of her own weaknesses, acknowledging her selfish and thoughtless nature. As my mother revealed the narrative of her tangled relationships, I couldn't help but see echoes of my own life, shadows of the choices I was on the brink of making. She spoke of wearing a blue dress, seeking attention, and taking her husband's for granted. It was as if she was painting a cautionary tale, a mirror reflecting my current struggles and the potential consequences of my actions. My head was as churned up as my belly. The weight of her words hit me harder than I expected. She described a cycle of self-destruction, a path I seemed poised to follow. The realization was both unnerving and awakening. In her tearful confessions, my mother admitted marrying Dagnow to spare him from the pain she had inflicted on her previous husbands. I comforted her, trying to offer support amid the emotional storm. Yet, as the stories unfolded, I couldn't escape the confrontation with my own reflection in her words. When she veered into my current situation, warning me of the consequences of my actions and the impact on Bradley, I felt a surge of nausea. The weight of truth, regret, and impending decisions overwhelmed me, and I staggered, collapsing onto the cold bathroom floor. The room spun, not just from the physical sickness, but from the emotional whirlwind that had gripped me. My mother's stories, a tapestry of missteps and heartbreaks, had wrapped around me, leaving me entangled in the consequences of her choices and the potential echoes in my own life. Struggling urgently to reach the bathroom, my arms trembled as I barely made it to the toilet, retching with mom by my side, holding my hair. She encouraged me to let out all the bad stuff, emphasizing the realization of the consequences of burning down one's own life repeatedly. Mom expressed a strong desire for me not to follow the same path. In the midst of my emotional and physical distress, I questioned my own actions, berating myself for the poor choices I had made. I acknowledged the warnings, particularly from Bradley, and condemned myself for not heeding them. The harsh self-talk included doubts about deserving my husband, love, and the happy home with Braylon and Caden. 
The fear of following in my mother's footsteps was evident, and I chastised myself for what I perceived as a destructive pattern in relationships. The tirade ended with a bleak prediction of ending up alone after several meaningless marriages in a similar kind of hell. After what felt like nine years of that, Mom gave me some mouthwash and made me eat two more cookies. She said the ginger would settle my stomach. She brushed my hair and let me change my clothes. I didn't even have to go into the bag I'd packed. We're the same size. I could wear any of her clothes. So she gave me some comfy sweats and kids. She bundled me in her car and drove me two miles to Tommy and Bernice's house. She's all cried out. Mom informed my brother about my condition as she took care of me, expressing that I now understood the consequences of my actions. She instructed him to put me straight to bed and she would join them for pancakes whenever I managed to get up and gather myself. Grateful, my brother thanked her and explained that Jonathan and the baby were currently asleep, a precious moment they took advantage of whenever possible. Mom kissed him, expressing love, and mentioned seeing him at a more decent hour. Tom guided me inside and directed me to the nursery room, mentioning they weren't using it yet. Little Lila was peacefully asleep with her mother in the master bedroom, nestled in a crib-like extension beside their bed. Tom assured me that he wouldn't lecture me, acknowledging that our mom had probably done enough of that. He understood that I would spend the night processing everything, hoping I could get some sleep. Before concluding, he felt the need to share something about Bradley, clarifying that he hadn't spoken to him since I left. Despite acknowledging that I knew Bradley better, he wanted to emphasize something he might not have seen in him before. In a brother-to-brother-in-law manner, Tom revealed that Bradley was a fighter. He elaborated on Bradley's background as an Olympic fencer, who worked as a combat consultant and choreographer for movies and theater productions, emphasizing Bradley's real understanding of a genuine bout, despite making things appear flashy and spectacular. As he referred to Bradley as a fighter, the weight of the words echoed through my thoughts. My brother painted a vivid picture of Bradley's commitment to me and our family, likening him to a warrior, a Navy SEAL, a force to be reckoned with. Despite Bradley's lack of combat experience, my brother emphasized the unwavering determination and protective instincts he held for us. It was a powerful message, a reassurance that Bradley would go to great lengths to keep us safe and united. The gravity of my brother's warning settled in, a stark reminder that attempting anything like my recent struggles would be futile. Bradley, armed with knowledge and a deep commitment, would not be deceived. My brother's intervention had shed light on Bradley's awareness, and I felt a mix of gratitude and relief. In a surprising revelation, my brother shared that our father had warned Bradley about potential challenges before we got married. It was a preemptive son-in-law talk, offering a unique perspective on marriage and human nature. The conversation highlighted the lengths my family had gone to, preparing for the possibility of me straying down a destructive path. As my brother expressed his willingness to intervene and support me, I couldn't help but feel a sense of security. He kissed my forehead, offering a brotherly protection that brought comfort and reassurance. That night, I slept soundly, the weight of the revelations and the emotional turmoil of the past days beginning to lift. The next morning, the familiar chaos of family life greeted me, a mix of energetic children, misplaced shoes, and unbrushed teeth. It felt different in this new setting, but there was a hint of nostalgia for the earlier, more hectic days of parenting. As we gathered for breakfast, I couldn't help but admire my brother's family. Bernice, his wife, embodied grace and beauty, effortlessly balancing motherhood with her gymnast's physique and delicate Belgian accent. My brother's protective instincts extended to her, ensuring a haven of security for their family. The pancakes served that morning were not just a breakfast, they carried the flavor of emotional release and the optimism for better days. The conversation navigated away from past troubles, allowing us to share moments of joy and connection. Later, as mom drove my car to meet us, the mention of a little something in the back caught my attention. She revealed it was her blue dress, a symbolic gesture of letting go. Despite its outdated style, she believed in its comeback, a hopeful reminder that even after facing the shadows of the past, there could be a resurgence of brighter days. I suppose we could classify it as vintage, Mom said with a slight half-shrug. You're an adult, a beautiful one. You'll make your own decisions. Do what you want with it. Just please, try not to repeat my mistakes. Don't use it to break your husband's heart. And for heaven's sake, never let your father catch you wearing it.
It would surely give him a heart attack. I won't, Mom. Thank you. Have a safe journey home. I love you. Love you too. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Before starting the car, I sent two messages. In the first message to Richard, I canceled my trip to Chicago, instructing him to cancel the plane tickets, the booked room, and the conference registration, seeking a refund for the fee. I suggested finding someone else for his plans and expressed anger for threatening my marriage and family, almost ruining my life. I demanded no further communication, except in a professional context, which should be kept to a minimum. I warned him to avoid my husband and brother for his own safety, as they were aware of everything. In the second message to Bradley, I apologized for the situation and regretted causing worry. I acknowledged acting without considering him and promised never to contemplate such actions again. I pledged never to take him for granted, to never underestimate him and always prioritize him. I thanked him for intervening and vowed to be the one to stop myself from now on, understanding the family history. I expressed deep love for him and recognized that he deserved better than the neglect, disrespect, and foolishness I had shown. I solemnly promised never to repeat such behavior. As I embarked on the journey home, a realization struck me about what to do with Mom's blue dress. I decided to destroy the garment, 